What's up, Wildcats? Mr. Waka coming at you from the main office on Monday. We've been giving out Chromebooks to our second um, through fifth graders today, and it's been a little chilly out, but we're happy that you guys have the equipment. Um, and you know, now you get all your, you know, everyone should be able to get their instructions online, except for the little kids. Um, and we'll continue to print out packets. Um, but let's go to chapter 10 of our favorite story, the series of unfortunate events. So the last chapter, uh, we saw that you know, Klaus had figured out the plan uh, that Olaf was using this whole play as a, a sham to kind of trick them into an official marriage so he could take their money. He called them out on it, and lo and behold, Olaf, of course, stole um, little the baby Sunny, puts her up on a, a tower and says, you know, to Violet, either you do what I tell you to do or I'm going to have my assistant drop Sunny and she'll die. So until the play's over, she's going to stay in this tower. And Violet says, what am I going to do? But she realizes, you know, her sister is the most important thing, so she's going to go with the marriage. So let's start. Chapter 10. That night, Klaus was the Bolidaer orphan sleeping fitfully in the bed, and Violet was the Bolidaer orphan staying up, working by the light of the moon. All day, the two siblings had wandered around the house, doing the assigned chores and scarcely speaking to each other. Klaus was too tired and despondent to speak and Violet was holed up in the inventing area of her mind, too busy planning to talk. Uh, too busy planning to talk. When night approached, Violet gathered up the curtains that had been Sonny's and bed and brought them to the door to the tower stairs, where the enormous assistant of Count Olaf's, the one who looked like neither a man or a woman, was standing guard. Violet asked whether she could bring the blankets to her sister to make her more comfortable in the nighttime. The enormous creature merely looked at Violet with its blank wide eyes and shook his head, then dismissed her with a silent gesture. Violet, of course, knew that Sonny was too terrified to be comforted by a handful of draperies, but she hoped that she could be allowed a few moments to hold her and tell her that everything would turn out okay. She also wanted to do something known in the crime industry as casing the joint. Casing the joint means observing a particular location in order to formulate a plan. For instance, if you were a bank robber, although I hope you aren't, you might go to the bank a few days before you plan to rob it, perhaps wearing a disguise. You'd look around the bank and observe the security guards, the cameras, and other obstacles so you could plan how to avoid capture or death during your burglary. Violet, a law-abiding citizen, was not planning to rob a bank but she was planning to rescue Sonny and was hoping to catch a glimpse of the tower room in which her sister was being held prisoner so as to make her plan more easily. Uh, but it appeared that she wasn't going to be able to case the joint after all. This made Violet nervous as she sat on the floor by the window working on her invention as quietly as she could. Violet had very few materials with which to invent something, and she didn't want to wander around the house looking for more for, looking for more for fear of arousing the suspicious Count Olaf and his troop. But she had enough to build a rescuing device. Above the window was a sturdy metal rod from which the curtains had hung, and Violet took it down. Using one of the rocks Olaf had, Olaf had left in a pile in the corner, she broke the curtain rod into two pieces. She then bent each piece of the rod into several sharp angles, leaving tiny cuts on her hands as she did so. Then Violent took down the painting of the eye. On the back of the painting, as on, on the backs of many paintings, was a small piece of wire to hang a hook. She removed the wire and used it to connect the two pieces together. Violet now made what looked like a large metal spider. Then she went over to the cardboard box and took out the ugliest of the clothes that Mr. Poe had purchased, the outfits the Bolidar orphans would never wear, no matter how desperate they were. Working quickly and quietly, she began to tear these into long, narrow strips and to tie the strips together, and to tie the strips together. Among Violet's many useful skills was a vast knowledge of different types of knots. The particular knot she was using was called the Devil's Tongue, a group of female Finnish pirates invented it back in the 15th century and named it the Devil's Tongue because it twisted this way and that in a most complicated and eerie way. The Devil's Tongue was a very useful knot, and when Violent tied the cloth strips together end to end, it formed a sort of rope. 
As she worked, she remembered something her parents had said to her when Klaus was born, and again when they brought Sunny home from the hospital. You are the eldest Polidaire child, they said, kindly but firmly, and as the eldest, it will always be your responsibility to look after your younger siblings. Promise us that you will always watch out for them and make sure they do not get into trouble. Violet remembered her promise and thought of Klaus, whose bruised face still looked sore, and Sonny dangling from the top of the tower like a flag and began working faster. Even though Count Olaf was, of course, the cause of all this misery, Violet felt as if she had broken her promise to her parents and vowed to make it right. Eventually, using enough of the ugly clothing, Violet had a rope that was, she hoped, just over 30 feet long. She tied one end of it to the metal spider and looked at her handiwork. What she had made was called a grappling hook, which is something used for climbing up the sides of buildings, usually for a nefarious purpose. Using the metal end to hook onto something at the top of the tower and the rope to aid her climb, Violet hoped to reach the top of the tower, untie Sunny, and climb back down. This was, of course, a very risky plan, both because it was dangerous and because she made the grappling hook herself instead of purchasing from a store that sold such things. But a grappling hook was all Violet could think to make without a proper inventing laboratory, and time was running short. She hadn't told Klaus about her plan because she didn't want to give him false hope. So without waking him up, she gathered up her grappling hook and tiptoed out the room. Once outside, Violet realized her plan was even more difficult than she thought. The night was quiet, which would mean she would have to make practically no noise at all. The night also had a slight breeze, and when she pictured herself swinging in the breeze, clinging to a rope made of ugly clothing, she almost gave up. And the night was dark, so it was hard to see where she could toss the grappling hook and have the metal arms hook onto something. But, standing there, shivering in her nightgown, Violet knew she had to try. Using her right hand, she threw the grappling hook as high and as hard as she could and waited to see if it would catch something. Clang! The hook made a noise as if it hit the tower, but it did not stick to anything. And it came crashing back down. Her heart pounding, Violet stood stock still, wondering if Count Olaf or one of his accomplices would come out to investigate the noise. But nobody arrived after a few moments, and Violet, swinging the hook over her head like a lasso, tried again. Clang, clang. The grappling hook hit the tower twice as it bounced back down to the ground. Violet waited again, listening for footsteps, but all she heard was her ter own terrified pulse. She decided to try one more time. Clang. The grappling hook hit the tower and fell down again, hitting Violet hard on the shoulder. One of the arms tore her nightgown and cut through her skin. Biting down on her hand to keep from crying out in pain, Violet felt the place in her shoulder where she'd been struck, and it was wet with blood. Her arm throbbed in pain. At this point in the proceeding, if I were Violet, I would have given up. But just as she was about to turn around and go inside, she pictured how scared Sonny must be. And ignoring the pain in her shoulder, Violet used her right hand to throw the hook once again. Clap. The usual clang sound stopped halfway through, and Violet saw in the dim light of the moon that the hook was not falling. Nervously, she gave the rope a good hard yank, but it stayed put. The grappling hook had worked. Her feet touching the side of the stone tower and her hands grasping the rope, Violet closed her eyes and began to climb. Never daring to look around, she pulled herself up the tower, hand over hand, all the time keeping in mind her promise to her parents and the horrible things Count Olaf would do if his plan worked out. The evening wind blew harder and harder as she climbed higher and higher, and several times Violet had to stop climbing as the rope shook in the wind. She was certain that any moment the cloth would tear, or the hook would slip, and Violet would be sent tumbling to her death. But thanks to her inventing skills, Everything worked out just the way it was supposed to work, and suddenly Violet found herself feeling a piece of metal instead of a cloth rope. 
She opened her eyes and saw her sister Sunny, who was looking frantically and trying to say something past the strip of tape. Violent arrived at the top of the tower, right at the window where Sunny was tied. The eldest bolded air orphan was about to grab her sister's cage and begin her descent when she saw something that made her stop. It was the spidery end of the grappling hook, which after several attempts had finally struck onto something on the tower. Violent had guessed during her climb that it had found some notch in the stone or part of the window or perhaps a piece of furniture inside the tower and stuck there. But that was not what the hook had stuck on. Violet's grappling hook had struck on another hook, and it was one of the hooks on the hook-handed man. And his other hook, Violet saw, was glinting in the moonlight as it reached right towards her. That was chapter 10. Go Wildcats.